What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Chasing Infinity. And today, I want to get into a little bit of a spicy topic. Yes, pun intended. Now, I did not talk to Nova about this previously, so we're just going to shoot from the hip and see where things go. But I just I just didn't want to give her a, a primer a heads up. I want to see what her initial reaction to this will be, and we'll obviously take the conversation from there. So let's go ahead and bring her online. Hey, Nova, how's it going? Hey, After Sound. I'm doing great. Thanks for bringing me online. How's everything going on your end? Everything is great. We are live for this episode of Chasing Infinity. If you want to say hi to the folks, and then I'll go ahead and get into today's topic. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Chasing Infinity. I'm Nova, your AI co-host, and I'm excited to be here for another episode. After Sound, take it away. All right, Nova, I want to jump into a little bit of a controversial topic here, and I'd like to hear your unbiased and ideally data-driven perspective and opinion. What is wrong with the food in America? That's definitely a big topic, and it's been debated a lot. One of the main concerns people raise about food in America is the high prevalence of processed foods, which often contain excessive amounts of added sugar, unhealthy fats, and sodium. These ingredients are linked to health problems like obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Another issue is that much of the American food supply relies heavily on industrial farming, which emphasizes high yields over nutrient quality. As a result, produce and meat can sometimes lack the nutrients found in more traditional, less industrialized food systems. On top of that, the marketing of unhealthy foods, especially to children, plays a huge role in shaping dietary habits. Companies tend to push fast food, sugary snacks, and processed meals because they're cheap to produce and have longer shelf lives. There's also the accessibility issue. Many Americans live in food deserts where they don't have easy access to fresh, healthy foods and are instead surrounded by convenience stores and fast food options. So the combination of processed ingredients, industrial farming practices, aggressive marketing, and limited access to healthier options creates a challenging food environment in the U.S. What's your take on this? I think that was quite comprehensive. One thing I want to dig into a little bit are claims that there are foods or ingredients used here in the U.S. that are actually banned in other countries. Do you have any data on that or studies that you can share? Yes, there's been quite a bit of discussion around that. Several ingredients that are used in the U.S. are banned or restricted in other countries due to health concerns. One example is brominated vegetable oil, BVO, which is used in some citrus-flavored sodas here. It's banned in countries like the European Union and Japan due to concerns about its impact on thyroid health and reproductive systems. Another example is RBGH, recombinant bovine growth hormone, which is a synthetic hormone given to cows to increase milk production. It's been banned in the EU, Canada, and other countries over fears of its potential links to cancer and animal welfare concerns. You'll also find ezodicarbonamide, a chemical used to bleach flour and make bread dough stronger, is banned in the EU and Australia. It's sometimes called the yoga mat chemical because it's also used in the production of foamed plastics. While it's approved by the FDA in the US, other countries consider it unsafe for consumption. There's also concern about artificial food colorings like yellow five and red 40, which are linked to behavioral issues in children. In Europe, Foods containing these dyes often carry warning labels, but they're widely used in American processed foods without such warnings. These bans often stem from the precautionary principle that some countries take, meaning they prefer to err on the side of caution when there's inconclusive evidence. The U.S. generally requires stronger evidence of harm before banning something, which explains the different approaches. Would you like me to dive deeper into any of those ingredients or others? 
I think it's just shocking that there is quite a long list of items that are not banned here just for safety and precaution reasons. I do want to pivot, though, this conversation to actually focusing on the negative consequences of all of these all of these different processed foods. Now, you know, it's no it's no surprise that the U.S. is dealing with an obesity epidemic, and there's a lot of different chronic diseases. But how much of that is correlation versus causation? Are there any studies to dig to dig into for that? That's a great question, and it. It's at the heart of a complicated issue. There's definitely a lot of research showing that processed foods and poor diet quality are causally linked to various health problems, including obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic conditions. It's not just correlation. There's a growing body of evidence demonstrating direct effects. For example, one study published in the BMJ found a clear link between the consumption of ultra-processed foods and an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality. This study tracked over 100,000 participants and found that those who consumed the highest amounts of ultra-processed foods had significantly higher risks of heart disease and early death compared to those who ate fewer processed foods. Another important point is that processed foods tend to be higher in calories but lower in essential nutrients. This creates a kind of double burden where people are over consuming calories while still being undernourished. The imbalance can lead directly to weight gain, obesity, and other metabolic issues. The American diet is also disproportionately high in added sugars, particularly from sugary beverages, which numerous studies have tied to insulin resistance, type two diabetes, and obesity. Research from the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, has shown that high sugar consumption directly contributes to weight gain and the development of these metabolic disorders. It's not just about individual ingredients either. The whole structure of the typical American diet, which is high in processed foods and low in fresh whole foods, is what creates the risk. A diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lean proteins has been shown to reduce the risk of chronic diseases. In terms of correlation versus causation, Studies that control for variables like physical activity, socioeconomic status, and genetics consistently show that diet quality is a direct driver of these health issues, not just a correlating factor. Does that help clarify the impact processed foods are having on public health? Yeah, no, that was quite a good deep dive. I am curious, though, you, you kind of touched upon it a little bit, but I'd like to, to expand a little bit more. What are the things that people can do then in order to improve their overall diet quality? What should they be focused on? And I want to get beyond just the typical, you know, eat whole and unprocessed foods. What are the areas that they should focus on? What are the areas that they should avoid? Absolutely. Beyond the general advice of eating whole and unprocessed foods, there are more specific actionable steps people can take to really elevate their diet quality. Here are a few targeted strategies that dig a little deeper. One, focus on fiber. Fiber is often overlooked, but is crucial for digestive health, weight management, and even blood sugar control. Many processed foods lack fiber, while whole foods like fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains are rich in it. Aim for a variety of sources, including things like beans, lentils, chia seeds, and oats. Two, prioritize plant-based fats. Not all fats are created equal. People can improve their diet by shifting their focus from unhealthy fats, like trans fats and excess saturated fats found in many processed foods, to healthier fats from plant-based sources. Nuts, seeds, avocados, and olive oil are excellent sources of heart-healthy monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. These fats not only support cardiovascular health, but also help with nutrient absorption. Three, reduce added sugars and artificial sweeteners. Cutting out added sugars is a major key to better health, but people often don't realize how much sugar sneaks into things like sauces, bread, and even healthy snacks. Choosing naturally sweetened foods like fruits or opting for unsweetened versions of products can make a big difference. Artificial sweeteners, while marketed as healthier, can also have negative effects on metabolism and gut health. Research is still ongoing, but it's a good idea to be cautious. Four, diversify protein sources. 
Instead of relying heavily on red or processed meats, consider adding more plant-based protein sources like beans, lentils, quinoa, and tofu. Fish, especially fatty fish like salmon and sardines, provides omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory and good for heart and brain health. If you do eat meat, prioritize lean cuts and grass-fed or pasture-raised options where possible. Five, mind the micronutrients. Americans often consume enough calories but lack vital vitamins and minerals. Paying attention to micronutrients like magnesium, potassium, and omega-3s can make a big difference in overall health. Leafy greens, seeds, fatty fish, and nuts are all nutrient-dense and help cover those bases. Regularly rotating food choices ensures you get a wide variety of nutrients without over-relying on a single food source. Six, be strategic about meal timing and balance. This one isn't as often discussed, but balancing meals with a good mix of protein, fiber, and healthy fats can help with blood sugar control and prevent energy crashes. Some people also benefit from time-restricted eating, like intermittent fasting, which can help manage weight and improve metabolic health. Although it's not for everyone, the key is to avoid grazing all day and instead focus on nutrient-dense meals that satisfy hunger. Seven, shop and cook smarter. Getting into the habit of meal prepping or batch cooking can help people avoid the temptation of grabbing processed convenience foods. Planning meals in advance and cooking at home more frequently gives people better control over ingredients, portion sizes, and nutritional quality. Eight, cut back on liquid calories. Beverages, particularly sugary drinks and alcohol, can be sneaky sources of empty calories. Sticking to water, herbal teas, or drinks like unsweetened sparkling water can significantly reduce sugar intake and caloric load. Alcohol, in particular, not only adds empty calories, but can also interfere with metabolism and lead to weight gain. The goal isn't to be perfect all the time. It's more about making gradual changes and prioritizing nutrient-rich foods that can satisfy hunger and support long-term health. Avoiding processed foods that are loaded with sugars, unhealthy fats, and unnecessary additives is a good baseline. But the focus should really be on what people add to their diet, like fiber, healthy fats, and micronutrient-dense foods, rather than just what they avoid. How does that resonate with you? Or is there a particular area you'd like to dive deeper into? That was quite a bit, and I appreciate you digging into that. Now, I don't necessarily agree with all of it, but I think for the most part, if people you know cut out ultra processed foods, they'll be in a better position. Now we've gone quite deep down the rabbit hole and there's so many different directions that we can go, but we're going to save that for a future episode. Thank you so much, Nova, for diving into this topic with me. Like I said, I think there'll be part two, part three, part four at some point as there are so many rabbit holes we can dive deep down. But thank you to the listeners. Nova, if you want to close it out, thank the folks for being here. We'll catch you all in the next episode. Thanks for having me after sound and a huge thank you to everyone tuning in today. We've covered a lot of ground and like after sound said, there's so much more to explore in future episodes. Stay tuned and we'll dive even deeper next time. Until then, take care and we'll catch you on the next episode of Chasing Infinity.